please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Deborah Kramer. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, the National Academies, for inviting me to join all of you this evening. Um, I've said this before, but I cannot say often enough how grateful I am to the National Academies and the Keck Initiative for honoring the Narrow Edge with their Best Book Award. This means so much to the shorebirds and to life at the edge of the sea, especially now. Science is the foundation of how we understand the Earth and solve many of our most pressing problems. So this award, honoring science and scientists, the dedicated people whose work is represented in this book, and its strong message about the environment at a time when the environment is coming under attack is very, very important. It also validates the somewhat risky choice I made writing this book. I'd been intrigued by the extraordinary migration of the red knot, a tiny bird that flies from one end of the earth to the other each year, and by its odd relationship with the horseshoe crab, an ancient animal I have always loved and mourned when it disappeared from the creek behind my home. But my personal curiosities are not necessarily particularly salient or persuasive reasons for any publisher to take on my book. Because my subject, as you can see here, <laughs> is a marketing nightmare. <laughs> the animals in what I freely admit are this fake image prepared for me by my daughter cannot read. They cannot buy books and they're decidedly uncharismatic. <laughs> few people have heard of them, fewer have seen them, and few would notice, at least in the short term, if they disappeared. This is basically a recipe for a disaster. Yet Jean Thompson Black and Yale University Press supported this choice, and so did the Ocean Foundation and the Munson Foundation and Wellesley College these days, it really takes a village to write a book. But this is because it's my job to give voice to these animals that cannot speak, have no seat at the regulatory tables where their fates are decided, and whose lives are nonetheless intertwined with ours. So tonight, I'm going to share a little of the story so you can see what this book is about, and then a little of the backstory, some of the choices I made while I was writing it. Now, the last thing I write, but the first thing everybody sees, is the title of the book. So I'm going to begin there. This is perhaps the most important, and for me, the most agonizing and divisive aspects of writing a book. If you want to fight with somebody, it's usually over the title. And I spent, I, I really can't bear to count how many hours, days, weeks, obsessing over how to evoke, in a few simple words, what was for me over four years of work. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about what I was thinking about when I chose this title. The Narrow Edge that liminal, porous place belonging to both land and sea, a place astonishingly rich and fertile, yet increasingly congested and fragile. Its edges, as we have seen in the past few weeks, are neither fixed nor firm. Yet almost half the U.S. population is now living in a coastal county. You know this place. A tiny bird, the red knot, a sandpiper weighing no more than a cup of coffee that flies along the edge of two entire continents, practically from pole to pole and back every year. It's a bird that captured the hearts of two eminent ornithologists, 
writing more than 60 years ago when abundance had a very different meaning than it does today. And to these men, who'd seen more than their share of large, charismatic birds, including many ivory-billed woodpeckers, this less conspicuous red knot represented to them, and I'm going to quote here, an untrammeled wildness and freedom that is equaled by few and surpassed by none. An ancient crab, this guy. <laughs> the horseshoe crab comes ashore once a year at the highest of spring's high tides in the nights of the new and full moons to lay its eggs in the sand. Its eggs fuel the migration of shorebirds, and its blue blood safeguards our own health. An epic journey of the birds traveling an extraordinary 19,000 miles every year, staying aloft for days at a time, and building their nests in one of the most inhospitable places on the planet. Their journey is an affirmation of life. An epic journey of the horseshoe crab, not across space like the bird, but across time. Horseshoe crabs are among Earth's oldest animals, having survived every one of the planet's mass extinctions, including the big one that wiped out 97% of life in the sea. An epic journey of the people in this story, scientists and regular citizens whose dedication, country by country, year by year, season by season, and beach by beach, is repairing our torn world and renewing life at the sea edge. Some of you may see yourselves in this story. Now, I uh, did not go on an epic journey. I don't categorize what I did to write this book that way, but I did travel for thousands of miles to places I never imagined I would be and will probably never see again accompany this bird. Its story is the story now of millions of shorebirds in North America and across the world. So if you've never seen a red knot before, here's one uh, not reading <laughs> on the beach in Delaware Bay. But its annual migration begins in Bialomas, a long, lonely beach on the Strait of Magellan in Tierra del Fuego. This empty beach extends for mile after mile, broken only by the occasional guanaco leaping the fencing from the adjacent upland estancias, and the only sound, the sound of the wind. The tidal flats here are seven miles wide, so when the water ebbs, the mud reaches all the way to the horizon. The birds come in with the tide. From a distance, the flock looks like tiny wisps of smoke that then materialize into this large cloud sailing over the mud. And then as the water rushes in, like this. And you can't see us, <laughs> but we're standing in this flock, the largest concentration of red knots in what is their last remaining home on Cher del Fuego. An American and a Canadian brought news of this place to the wider world. Curious about where red knots disappeared for most of the year, they drove 2,000 miles down the coast of Brazil and Argentina, looking. This was at a time when you could just ask a question and get a lot of money to do the research and you didn't really know, have to know the answer in advance. They rented the cheapest car they could find a dilapidated Citroën that fell apart literally as they were driving. And then they got all the way down here and they missed this mother load the first time. But failing, they got money to try again. <laughs> now I take readers to this isolated remote place so they can experience it. And it is here that Carmen Espose, Dean of the Faculty of Sciences at a big university in Santiago, feels she's most at home. She works all day here, which in the summer is all night, in the blustery wind, which is often blowing at hurricane strength, following the birds in and out with the tide, figuring out what they're eating, how the abundance of their food is changing, and why their numbers are dropping, 70% in the last few decades. 
To me, their journey now is like climbing a ladder where every rung is necessary and broken ones along the way are jeopardizing the entire trip. We've broken this ladder rung by rung, and rung by rung, we can fix it and must. And I think this is a good place uh, to also say that I am uh, really grateful to um, a foundation that I realize rather belatedly is housed right near here, the Marisla Foundation, because they are contributing substantially to the Spanish translation of this book, which is going to bring it to an entire half of the flyway um, in South America, and that is just really exciting. Now, as I moved along this flyway, uh, each stopover that I chose to include in the book added a different layer, a different dimension um, to this story. So this is a very different kind of place. This is Las Grutas, Argentina, early in the morning. There's no other time of day to get a picture like this because this beach, one of Argentina's fastest growing resorts, never looks like this. It's usually filled with ATVs, radios, dogs, you name it, um, while the birds are trying to feed in the few hours that their food is exposed by the ebbing tide. The lead scientist here, Patricia Gonzalez, is inspiring an entire generation of kids to care about life at the sea edge. She's placed this sign, we are all shorebirds, the scientist has done this, um, out on the flat, explicitly calling us to consider how the health of shorebirds is intertwined with ours and how what's at stake for them is also at stake for us. This is a powerful approach, and she has achieved breathtaking success there. When I was in Argentina, I saw kids from hundreds of miles away earning money, which is not very easy to do there, to be with her every summer, tracking birds in the blistering hot sun, literally walking in her footsteps. And they want to be just like her when they grow up. And in this town, Las Grutas, where the winners of the high school beauty pageant once wanted to be movie stars, I mean, they wanted to, excuse me, marry movie stars and live lives of glamour, still want that life of glamour. But to them, glamour means something really different now. It means being a biologist or being a park ranger. This is an astonishing and profound change in attitude in this place. Now, I uh, went to Texas, also the home of two red knots, Rufa from the Atlantic Flyway and the Rosalari red knot um, from here in the Pacific. And in Texas, I met a scientist who took me up over the Laguna Madre in this plane, garishly painted to look like the Texas flag. <laughs> now, um, it looks pretty steady in this image. <laughs> But the uh, pilot is swerving and plunging as the uh, biologist is tracking red knots with radio tags. I'm throwing up in the back, <laughs> and uh, the biologist is discovering a previously um, undocumented place where young birds are wintering. And this spot still haunts me because below us, we can see the Department of Homeland Security looking for walkers. As we are edging closer and closer to the Rio Grande and the Mexican border, looking for birds whose homes know no political boundaries. And then later, tagging birds with data trackers, the scientist is finding a long forgotten route that the birds still take through the Great Plains and the prairie potholes up into Canada. This is really important information if we are gonna restore this bird to its former numbers. And then in this place, one of the most, this is the Laguna, one of the most heavily redesigned, humanly redesigned seascapes I have ever seen. There was this snowy egret, this reddish egret, and this tricolored heron, sign that restoration, even in a place like this, is possible. 
Each critical stop on this flyway fell into a larger picture. And I wrote about that a lot in the book, but tonight I wanted to just share this, because mostly I'm going to show you pictures this evening. If you want to read, you can read. I'm just going to give you a few passages to get, give you a sense of what the, the rhythm of the book. So I said, flying from one home to the next along their migration, red knots carry an imprint of each place the quality of their lives in one, enhanced or diminished by their lives in another. At the end of their journey, they have taken the measure of a shoreline running the length of the earth. Today, that shoreline is wanting. The birds need sustenance and safe harbor along the way. And by that, I mean this is a, uh, a skinny bird. It's November, and the bird is in Argentina. It's just arrived, and it's hungry. And over the next few months, uh, probably until February, early March, it will be doubling its weight so that it looks like this. <laughs> and the reason for that, you can see on this map, um, this is the map of a red knot whose migration has been tracked with a data logger. And you don't have to look at all the numbers. I just wanted to point out a couple of things. This bird threw, flew 3,000 miles south in eight days and 5,000 miles north in six days. And these were all nonstop flights. So if you don't like to think about the numbers, um, these birds have been known to go from the Brazil-Uruguay border um, or from to the Outer Banks of North Carolina and from northern Brazil to Delaware Bay without stopping. Now, aside from the enormous physical stamina required to make these long navigations, how do the birds know where they're going? Are they navigating by Earth's magnetic field, by the stars? We're not really sure. We do know that they have phenomenal sense of weather systems, that they understand weather systems moving across entire ocean basins. And the way one researcher described it to me, he said, shorebirds always know where they are relative to where they're going. And then he said, the same question might be asked of us. <laughs> and he didn't answer it, and uh, neither am I going to, except to say that the Rufa red knot, whose track is on this map, has been listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. The first US bird explicitly listed because global warming imperils its existence. It will not be the last. And along the Pacific Flyway, there are actually fewer red knots than along the Atlantic. And uh, for those of you who have an interest in red knots along the Pacific, I just wanted to mention this, there is now the Pacific America's Shorebird Conservation Strategy, which has been put together with a huge coalition of partners under the aegis of the National Audubon Society. Now, back east, Delaware Bay, the avian Serengeti of spring shorebird migration along the U.S. eastern seaboard, is a place whose health, even though it's all the way across the country, affects all of us right here. For me, this part of the story began not here in the broad daylight, but on a dark, empty beach in the middle of the night, where in a silence that was broken only by the sound of the waves gently <sighs> lapping against the shore, I would begin to hear about, I don't know, 40 minutes before the high tide, this sound of um, uh, clicking. And it was the horseshoe crab shells bumping against each other as thousands emerged from the sea to lay their eggs in the sand. And I will never forget this, uh, looking down this curve of beach in either direction, this long line of horseshoe crabs. And then after the tide peaked, the beach emptied. And 40 minutes later, it was as if no one had been there and the whole thing was just a dream. Horseshoe crabs are one of Earth's oldest animals, at least 450 million years old. 
They've lots to tell us about endurance and about survival. Very few animals alive then are with us now. These horseshoe crabs hail from a time that is so distant, it's hard to grasp. For me, it was a little easier if I, um, to understand the scale of this longevity if I collapsed the history of the Earth into one year. And if you do that, the horseshoe crab comes in the spring, around the time of the equinox. The first bird evolves in the fall. And we stroll in a few minutes before midnight on December 31st. <laughs> to me, this raises a very serious ethical question of who we are, such late arrivals, to be saying who has to leave and who can stay. Now, I realize, though, that not everyone cares about my ethics. But ethics aside, the survival of the horseshoe crab is very important. Delaware Bay is home to the last remaining population of horseshoe crabs in the world. And the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, is putting the American horseshoe crab on its red list. So how did we get into this horrid mess? Uh, we've taken, this is on Reeds Beach in New Jersey, on Delaware Bay. We've taken too many horseshoe crabs for bait. And compounding the problem, we're squeezing them off their spawning grounds with development, bulkheads, seawalls, that are increasing the rate of erosion. And then as the sea level is rising, these anchored beaches can't retreat and instead wash away a little faster. So to, to, to uh, give you a sense of what I mean by this, um, the storm surge of Hurricane Sandy destroyed 70% of New Jersey's most important horseshoe crab spawning beaches. Hurricane Sandy when it occurred, which was in 2012, was a once in every 25 year event. In 1950, it would have been a once in every 750 year event. And by 2050, this storm surge will occur in Delaware Bay every couple of years. While horseshoe crabs don't live along the California coast, all of us need them. Their blue blood is essential to our health, constituting the only test approved by the FDA to sense potentially deleterious bacterial contamination, that would be endotoxin, in our injected drugs and implanted medical devices. So if any of you have ever been vaccinated, had chemotherapy, heart stents, hip replacements, even simple IVs or PET scans, to name just a few, your health has been safeguarded by the exquisite sensitivity of the blue blood of the horseshoe crab. Now, it's so effective that most people don't even understand what the risks are of endotoxin infection. And so I'm going to read to you from Lewis Thomas, The Lives of a Cell. He wrote, Endotoxin is the very worst of bad news for humans. Sensing it, he says, we are likely to turn on every defense at our disposal. We will bomb, defoliate, blockade, seal off, and destroy all tissue in the area. The result, he says, is a shambles. The consequences, including fever and inflammation, low blood pressure, respiratory distress, suffocation, shock, and sometimes death. Now, thanks to the horseshoe crab, none of you has experienced this. This test is so sensitive, it can detect one drop of endotoxin in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Despite this, the population of horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay is depleted. We have stanched the decline after 17 years of regulation, but we have not yet restored the population. And I have to say that this upset me greatly. So I whipped off this editorial for the New York Times, a bird whose life depends on a horseshoe crab. 
And then the science continued to have policy implications because shorebird populations, many of them aren't doing very well right now. And the red knot, it turned out, is the bellwether for lots of other shorebirds. So I whipped off another op-ed, Silent Seashores. And um, this one was, came out just as the, the book came out. So this book, because I don't really believe in um, you know, glossing over unpleasant details, is about loss. But it's also out about the possibilities of restoration. This is Thompson's Beach in New Jersey. When I first began researching this book, there was hardly a horseshoe crab on this beach. It was full of macadam, cinder blocks, chimneys, the remains of a seaside village that had fallen into the sea in a hurricane from the 1950s and then abandoned. In the last few years, dedicated, persistent people have cleaned up the beach, taken away thousands of truckloads of debris, and replenished it with sand. And so now, in the past couple of years, there's been this kind of spawning on the beach. Now, why does something like this really matter? Here are the red knots on the beach. They're refueling for their long trip to the Arctic eating these, these tiny pin-sized eggs of the horseshoe crab. While the skinny bird you saw earlier had four months to double its weight in Delaware Bay, the red knots have 10 days to do the same thing. It's kind of a nauseating <laughs> proposition. <laughs> but if they don't get enough uh, eggs, they can't gain the weight they need for this really long flight. So whether the birds are coming up along the Pacific or along the Atlantic, the arc of their story and the arc of the narrow edge lead up to their nesting grounds in the Arctic. This is a piece of gravel in East Bay, Southampton Island, just south of the Arctic Circle. There's no radar. There's no lights, there's no room for error on this uh, so-called runway. <laughs> the bush pilots dropped us off here after a blinding storm had grounded us for days in Iqaluit, Baffin Island to the east. The pilots could not distinguish the snow on the ground from the clouds in the sky. And when we finally arrived on this day, the only nice day of the entire time I was there, um, we found a red knot with a flag on it. And so I immediately squandered my five minutes of satellite time a week to call into Delaware Bay and find out where this bird had been seen last. And it turned out that it was still in Delaware Bay when I had left to start coming up here. And while we were sitting in a Iqaluit watching Snow White for the second time, this bird was flying through a nor'easter, warmed only by its fat and its feathers, and guided by we don't know what. But there it was in East Bay before me. We lived in this rustic camp <laughs> for three weeks. And every day we crossed the aptly named Inconvenience Lake. <laughs> and uh, you can see why. We're, I'm uh, on my knees there because if we stand up, we'll just sink up to our thighs in the melting snow. And if that's ever happened to you, you know it's a rather unpleasant experience trying to get yourself out. And then once the lake melts, we have to walk all the way around it and then walk 8 to 10 to 12 miles every day tracking shorebirds on the tundra. And I was doing this with these guys so that I could bring back a first-hand account of how actions we are taking here at home are resonating so powerfully up there. The sea ice is melting, shortening the season for polar bears to hunt seals beneath the ice. The thinning ice can't hold these heavy, hungry polar bears who are now coming ashore to eat. And so there are a lot of guns in this chapter of the book. 
not because my getting a gun license and having under duress to learn to fire a shotgun reasonably accurately is intrinsically interesting to anybody other than my friends, but because the danger we faced from hungry polar bears is new here, and we had to carry these guns every single place we went all the time. I wrote about how life endures in this both bleak but beautiful and oddly friendly place. So here's a quick look at bleak. This is an Inuit sled we had in the camp. And um, if you look at a map of Southampton Island, a, a really detailed map of Southampton Island, you can see the names of the bodies of water around East Bay. And they are things like the Bay of God's Mercy, Repulse Bay. These waters were named by the explorers seeking the, southwest, the Northwest Passage in the early 1800s, and the names have not been changed. This is beauty and endurance. This is not the kind of lush spring I know in New England, but it's spring nonetheless in this harsh landscape. And then as the summer begins, the very short summer, and the storms kind of abate, the air is filled with singing, the singing of nesting birds. And I'm uh, going to just show you a few you might not have the opportunity to see for yourselves. Arctic terns dive bombing us every single place we walked. The king eider. Where I live, people, people come from all over to stand at the edge of the sea with powerful spotting scopes to see a king eider that looks kind of like this, even through your spotting scope. But these guys were nesting right outside the cabin where we were living. Red-throated loons all around Inconvenience Lake. Phalaropes spinning in every pond. Ruddy turnstones, a bird you may know, whose population isn't doing too well right now. These are the red knot eggs. Ruddy turnstone eggs. This is a, obviously a very close up shot of these. The eggs are, are, I don't know, they look really obvious in this picture, but they are powerfully, powerfully camouflaged up there in the rocks. They're very hard to find. This is a baby black-bellied plover hatching. And here's the red knot with two chicks that you can see. And I, I wanted to just point out uh, to the left this catkin. Uh, this is a willow tree. This is the tallest it gets up here. <laughs> uh, throughout the entire journey, I, uh, I filled baskets and baskets of these notebooks. I wrote down everything that anybody said, every story, everything anybody felt, including things like sitting down for dinner with this family that had, um, was amazing. They hunted or foraged every single thing they ate all year long. And they invited us for dinner, and we were sitting down, and I, uh, I think we were eating eider, actually. And I bit down on what I assumed was a peppercorn, and then when I realized there was a lot of peppercorns, and that I was in great danger of breaking my teeth, that it was actually birdshot. <laughs> and um, that was quite an experience. That hasn't been repeated yet, and I hope never to repeat that one. Um, but I, I wrote down everything because I didn't know how much of it was going to end up in the, in the story. And then I wrote draft after draft after draft. I think I wrote this book six or seven times. And I was just cutting, cutting, cutting. It's a really hard thing to do when you spend a lot of time writing a book to then just throw pages away. Um, but I did that because I didn't want to have a manuscript that was weighted by excess. I wanted it to be able to carry you aloft on this long migration. 
I wanted, I didn't want a lot of wasted verbiage. I wanted it to sing like the birds and to resonate in the deep recesses of time. And I'm not saying at all that I succeeded in doing that. It's just what I was trying to do. Now, there are many ways, though, to do something like this. And um, to show you one of them, I'm going to take you to James Bay. So um, after the birds leave the Arctic, they fly across the Canadian Muskeg, another to me, indecipherable landscape, to James Bay, Ontario. In this place, which is filled with five million mosquitoes per acre. (laughs) You know, we don't look too happy here. And then we would walk by uh, black bears every day um, and I wasn't at all scared of these guys that after the polar bears, they're only eating strawberries. And, um, and we would walk by them and then, again, s- spend all day looking for shorebirds. And they'd come here to refuel on tiny clams. And there's an artist um, uh, who lives in wa- out here on the West Coast in Washington who... Um, was inspired by this book to make a number of paintings about the flyway. And I wanted to show you this one that she made of James Bay. Um, In this painting, she pulls from the art of the Cree who live here. And if you look at it really carefully, you can see the ghosts of the once much larger population of birds that came through here. And then you can see the yellow of an acidifying bay. The increasingly corrosive sea will be a problem for shorebirds on both the Atlantic and the Pacific flyways. Now, for me, um, I love all her paintings. I mean, I could spend the entire evening just talking to you about her paintings. And I love them for one reason, primarily, This painting, like all the others, holds all the difficulties. But it is a thing of deep beauty speaking to the spirit. And this kind of expression is really, really important because facts alone, as um, Elizabeth Colbert pointed out recently in The New Yorker, do not necessarily change people's minds or open their hearts. This marsh um, is in James Bay, but it could actually be anywhere along the flyway where just off to the edge, the birds have been passing through in the last few weeks. And now they're, they're coming uh, further south, and they're coming through here. And um, I'm really sorry I was not able to reach this man before um, this talk tonight, so I will probably mispronounce his name. Um, but Don Hetchlin. You guys, some of you know him. He saw 15 red knots in Balsa Chica only a couple of weeks ago. (laughs) Sylvia Gallagher from Sea and Sage Audubon gave me a recent count of five near here. They've also been seen in the marshes near the Santa Ana River and in the upper and lower Newport Bay. Fifteen years ago, some of them actually wintered here. And you guys can go out with Uh, Sea and Sage Audubon, or the Newport Bay Conservancy, or join Orange County Birding and see what's out there. Um, These birds are just a marvel of resilience. Now this is Essex Bay, where I live in Massachusetts, also a place of great beauty, where a few, not that many, I think we've seen three maybe, This year, red knots are coming through right now. And where I continually learn that so much lies before us, hidden in plain sight. When I returned home after what was another really hard summer in the Arctic for these birds, on a warm afternoon, I think it was about this this same time of year, we paddled out into the bay, into this marsh and beached our kayaks and waited and waited. And then as the tide came in and the birds were crowding against the sand that remained, we saw them, three baby red knots. Their fresh plumage was shining in the afternoon light. 
And there they were on this sandbar behind my home, heading south on a route they had never traveled to a place they have never been, having come so many miles with so many more to go. So by the end, this story of a bird and a horseshoe crab about scientists and science had grown to become a story of tenacity and persistence, theirs and ours, of loss and how it can turn toward renewal, a story of aching beauty and of how we choose or don't choose to carry ourselves in this world. And finally, and most importantly, it was a homecoming, a call to return to our home, the earth that sustains us. So I'm going to read one passage from the book, and then if you have any questions, I would be delighted to try to answer them. Red knots speak to us of distant realms, uniting us along a line that stretches along the entire edge of continents. Their long flights through an immensity of sky that reaches from one end of the earth to the other embody our own longings and dreams. As we lose our own bearings, their flights offer a compass. In the tenacity of horseshoe crabs appearing on a moonlit beach, and in the resilience of shorebirds, a flock of knots lifting into the evening sky in Bialomas, their gentle voices singing in the Arctic stillness, or a lone bird flying through a hurricane, I find hope that we can face the challenges that lie before us, and in the possibility that our children will inherit an earth where wildlife will still have a home at the edge of the sea. Thank you. <laughs>